Welcome in everybody. Today, today is Tuesday, the 5th of February, 2020. My name is Kerry Holzman. Thank you for joining me. Hello to all my friends in blue who have uh, jumped in the chat room. And for those of you waiting patiently for me to get started today, I have a little bit of a late start. I got a still learning to put contact lenses in. I think I got some on me. Where is it? Over here. There's some saline solution. I might have this one in. I can't tell when they're reversed. I can't see the difference. So this one's feeling a little funny, but it's not blurry. This whole sort of journey down, I've never worn glasses until the last four years. And so I thought contacts would be good to try. And I'm, like, I'm, man, I put the right one in like that. It took me like a half an hour to do it the first time. It took me about 15 minutes yesterday and today right in. But the left eye struggled with that one and they keep flipping back and forth the lenses. And I'm looking at it, and I'm looking for like a V-shape or a U-shape. I can't tell. I don't know. But it just, uh, the right one I don't feel, and the left one I do. So I might stop. If it gets too irrit uh, irritating, I might stop and try and flip it the other way. Um, so you guys know that. <laughs> I don't know. It may just be that uh, it's just irritated because of how much I struggled to get it in there. But uh, thanks, you guys, for joining me today. i got a new build uh, to do today. I got, uh, yesterday we wrapped up the build for Valentine. That'll be going out today actually because I didn't have his mailing address yesterday. And then uh, I ended up, the, the front panel connectors on Valentine's machine kept falling off. I don't know why. So I got my little hot melt glue gun and I just sort of dabbed a little bit of hot melt glue around the power LED and hard drive LED. And that way that can peel right off if he ever has to take them off. But at least I feel better that uh, that they won't fall off in shipping. They were falling off here on the counter, and I adjusted the cable management, and they just weren't staying on like they should. And maybe that I could have crimped the connections a little tighter, but uh, the hot melt glue is a lot of times the way that uh, the big brands uh, often do things. With, back in the day with IDE cables, they used to go crazy with that hot melt, hot melt glue gun. But anyway, uh, it's safe with electronics, and uh, like I say, it can peel right off. Uh, contribution. A couple contributions have come in. Let me give a couple shots out to these generous folks here. Let's see what we got going on today. Um, Hugh Wong has contributed $2.50. <laughs> that was last night. And then $2.25. And then he, uh, Brendan Looney contributed two pounds. David Griswold, $5. Chris's Tech and Variety Channel has contributed a dollar. Thomas Robinson, one pound. Peter Laycock contributes 20 pounds. He goes, hey, Kerry, just back from the hospital operation, okay? and Amazon sorted in seven days. I think Peter just had his uh, appendix removed and that's usually a pretty simple operation, but you always like to make sure everybody's doing well. So thank you for the follow-up, Peter, and I'm glad to hear that, that that operation apparently went as expected, which is good to know. And of course, thank you for your contribution and all of your contributions. Peter's been a wonderful friend to the channel. Um, just a, a really cool dude. Uh, I hope one day I'll get to meet you in person. And Oyvind Wethal has contributed 100 Norwegian krona. So thank you guys so much for supporting the channel and helping to keep me sponsor free. I want to remind you that Uncle Kerry's Windows 10 Optimizer is on sale right now to the end of the month. It's 30% off, so it's $7. Now look, I ate at Arby's the other day. <laughs> Why? Cost me $9, more than $9. So for less than the price of one person's lunch at a fast food restaurant, you can have the Windows 10 optimizer that will take care of all of the optimizations you see me do for my customers. I used to do it here on video by hand, clickety, clickety, click, certain registry tweaks and little things like that to help speed up the performance of the computer. Just a little tiny bit, turn off indexing. It's all stuff you can still do by hand, but this just makes it happen a lot quicker and it does it consistently so I don't have to worry about did I, did I do that already or did I not? Did I turn off the hibernation file? So anyway, uh, especially the hibernation file thing because on a solid state drive, uh, however much RAM you've got, if you've got 32 gigs of RAM, then you're going to have a 32 gig hibernation file whether you use hibernation or you don't. The only way to get rid of it is to disable hibernation. And hibernation really only makes sense for machines running off batteries. It doesn't make sense for a desktop to have it. So that's one of the little optimization tweaks. And again, all of it you can do by hand. There's nothing magical in there. 
but it just does it very quickly and very consistently. And for seven bucks, you can run it on any number of computers you want to run it on. It is not limited. Uh, there's no license code to activate. It's on an honor system. So I'm simply asking you, don't give it away. That's all, you know. Um, that's the only thing I ask. And, and if people want to give it away and, uh, you know, it turns out there's like 100,000 copies out there and I only sold 800 copies or something, um, then obviously I just, it's not worth it to continue. You know what I mean? To, to, to keep making this stuff. The idea is really for you guys to help support the channel and then for me to give you something back in return. So anyway, uh, it's back on sale. It's normally $10. For the rest of this month, it'll be $7. The link for it, as well as the Netflix tool, is in the video notes below the video. So the Netflix tool came off of sale. It had an introductory sale last month. And so now uh, we're on to uh, this month. Decided it's been a few months. We'll put it back on sale again. And it's a good excuse to help support the channel. OK, um, today's build. This is going to a gentleman named Frank. Oh, I haven't even poured a Coke yet. Hold on. Today's build, as I said, is going to Frank. Frank paid for this on the 10th of January, and I'm just now starting to build it. Although, in all fairness, we were waiting on a part that didn't arrive till about two weeks ago. But that being said, I also want to mention, we talked about the Mugen 5 cooler being $60. It's back to $48.99 on Amazon again. I don't know why that one day it was $60, but if you look now, the Mugen 5 is back to $48.99 here at America at Amazon.com. Um, some people want to know what's going on with the Xenos computer, what's going on with the 3950X. As long as I have customers, paying customers patiently waiting for me, those little side projects, which are my own little passionate, uh, um, they're, they're not going to a paying customer. They're for me. They're for the channel to enjoy the build and to, and to use it for video editing and things like that. So those will always take a backseat to waiting customers. I will come back to revisit those. As soon as I take care of a few more customers, I have two more people, three more people waiting behind Frank. But Frank was next in line. And I hate the idea that somebody has waited a month for, before I could even you know, start building. And then when I'm done, it'll take another nearly a week to get it shipped to him if he's on the East Coast. So the good news is it's worth the wait. And uh, Frank has been very patient. Everybody's been really patient. And I, and, you know, I really appreciate that because it just adds to my stress. I, gotta, I push myself pretty hard to know that there's work waiting. And um, you know, it's a weight on my shoulders that I have to, uh, the only way to get it off my shoulders is to get it done. So anyway, um, today's build is going to be, again, using a Corsair 200R case. You know, that's pretty commonplace here on this channel. And we're gonna use a 600GD. This is a new model of power supply, certainly one I I uh, might have used one of these once before, but I think this is a pretty new um, design from EVGA. It's 80 plus gold. We're using an H370 HD3 motherboard with an i7-9700K CPU right here. And then for RAM, we've got 32 gigs of 2666 megahertz Corsair Vengeance. Storage, we got that ultra fast 970 Evo plus two terabyte. I don't know why this thing, this is about $430, used to be $400. Last I checked on Amazon, it was well over $500. So there's something going on there. I, I'm not exactly sure what, why that price is so outrageous. Of course, we're cooling it with the Mugen 5. And we got the optical drive. Stand by a second.
It's almost like they know when I go live. <laughs> like, I'm gonna hi. <laughs> Amazon's watching it going, go deliver his packages now. Okay. Glenn Davies in the chat says, let me guess, an Amazon delivery. You are correct, Glenn, yes. Um, that's funny though, because if he would arrive 10 minutes earlier, he would have caught me before I went live. What are you gonna do? Murphy's Law. So, <clears throat> so back to the parts list. We've got a, an Asus CD DVD reader writer. And then for graphics, it's a GeForce uh, GTX 1660 Ti. This is a good all-rounder uh, when it comes to, you know, not, not getting a graphics card that's going to be obsolete real quickly. Um, it's using the, the new uh, Turing architecture in there. And uh, you'll play all, you can play all the games, uh, all, any game that's out on the market, any of the AAA titles, it'll play easily at 1080 and then uh, also 1440. So if you want to play at 4K, this isn't the card for you, but um, it's right around $300 and I think it's a good value. And as I mentioned, we're keeping the CPU cool with, of course, the Scythe Mugen, Mugen 5, which, again, I want to reiterate, is back to its normal $47.99 price over at Amazon. And this eye is really bothering me. I have no idea if I'm going to... It's so weird to be new to contact lenses because I, uh, I don't know if it's just the discomfort of it or if I've got it flipped inside out. But the right eye doesn't bother me at all, and I'm... I have to talk to the, I go back on Monday to the eye doctor to talk about that, but. <clears throat> it's that or glasses, folks. Okay. So again, I wanna um, thank Frank for his patience as I'm getting caught up with these uh, orders. What ends up happening when you're self-employed, what I've experienced over the years is you get periods of everybody wants everything at the same time and then nobody wants nothing at the same time. So I've learned to just take on the work and say yes, knowing that once I get through that rush, there may be no other customers calling for a couple weeks. That's normal and in, in this case I look forward to it because it gives me an excuse to catch my breath and relax and you know avoid burnout. Unfortunately, in this particular case, I've already asked three people, three additional people on top of everybody else who's waiting, uh, to continue to wait before even initiating this process with me. Uh, and the reason for that is I just can't take on anymore. There's, there's no room in my house for anybody else's parts. I have to get stuff out. I really have to focus on that. Not only that, but there's uh, some interviews I want to get done and I cannot do the build and I cannot do an interview on the same day basically it's a whole different configuration that has to uh, uh, that I have to do here and I want to add more variety to the channel besides build after build after build so we I, I will have some interviews coming up directly after I get caught up with my backlog of work those interviews will include uh, David Hale David is a um, self-made millionaire he started just like the rest of us, created a tech company, and sold it. Now, there's lots of guys like Tony Robbins who motivate you to um, get off your butt and do something, but what's Tony Robbins ever done? He's really good at motivating people, and he's made a career out of it. But it's not the same as having Bill Gates tell you, or having uh, Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos tell you what he did, what his attitude was, and what his fears were. And, um, David, being in the tech industry and having done sort of what I'm trying to do, he's certainly in the same field, uh, I really want answers to questions regarding, you know, what was the scary parts, uh, you know, was it touch and go for a while, how long did it take, yada 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 and then furthermore the important question is when you're busting your butt doing what you got to do to run a company and then one day you sell that company what do you I mean imagine the first couple weeks of not going to work probably feel like a vacation but then 
I imagine you start wondering what your purpose is anymore because all these employees were counting on you and you were running the plane, you know, you're flying the plane. Now you've sold the plane and someone else is flying it and they don't need you anymore. So forget about the money. It, it, you, you cannot turn that off overnight. You can't go from, from you know, six hour nights of sleep for 30 years and then all of a sudden go, okay, I'm just sleep in today and hang out. Like I said, I think the first couple weeks probably feels like a vacation, but after a while you've got to uh, learn how to adjust or perhaps you know, become a serial <laughs> entrepreneur. Uh, but I'm going to talk to David about that. Also, I want to bring back Acronis. We're going to talk some more about Acronis Trimage 2020 and give examples on how to use it. So we're going to bring them back. And then I've got a couple other folks I'd like to interview in addition to more Tech Vets shows. And I can't do any of that and do builds or repairs at the same time. I just heard back from uh, one of the folks I built a computer for using the Nuka-Cola case. We went with the NZXT motherboard. He was kind of on the fence about whether or not he wanted to use that. And um, he emailed me today, or he texted me today, and he said that the machine won't boot anymore and he should not have gone with the NZXT motherboard. So somehow he's determined it's the board. Uh, I don't know, but I think everything had a three-year warranty. I think. I think it should still be under warranty. If not, uh, maybe he might want to send it back and we can put it up on the bench and diagnose it for him. He's a tech, so he'd only be doing it to support the channel. Certainly something he could do himself. But I, I want to talk to him about it because I think it'd be interesting. It's, it's highly unlikely that a machine I build fails to boot you know, certainly this early into the process, but I've never used one of those NZXT motherboards before. And to the best of my knowledge, they're made by a company I'm not a fan of. And that's why I don't normally use that. And, and this gentleman knew that and was willing to take that risk. And um, I very much would like to follow up with that and, and find out if in fact it is the board and not something else. But um, it's kind of sad news, you know. For me it is. Uh, even though it's not my fault, it's just the idea that we, we went with that for a specific look. That's why we went with the NZXT motherboard. It just looked really, really sharp in that uh, Nuka-Cola case. But I also found that uh, Gigabyte board that I ended up using for the gentleman in Australia and for myself, in my opinion, looks even better. But it, who knew until I got it in there? So we'll follow up with that. I'll let you know how that goes. Um, just makes me sad. Yeah, I'm, my concern about this, my left eye is, I can't tell. <laughs> this is gonna bother me. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure what's going on there. I might. I might have to take a break for a few minutes, and it could take a while because I'm not very efficient at taking these things out, putting them back in again, these contact lenses. But um, I'm going to try and get through it. I think <laughs> I think it's just irritated. I, I don't know what an inside-out contact lens feels like, so not yet. Okay, so I think what I want to do first of all is we're going to start the board prep, which means I'm going to take the power supply, set it over here, and the optical drive, and the video card, and we'll set that all over here for right now. And then that leaves us the CPU, the RAM, the solid state drive, and the CPU cooler. 807 people watching live right now. Take them out now if it's irritating you. Well, I wouldn't just take it out. I want to I want to flip it the other way. It, it it seems to flip either way real easily on my finger. And it's got a little blue tint to the edge and I can't tell if the blue tint is supposed to I think it's supposed to face outward and not inward. And you're supposed to be able to hold a contact lens and it should have like a U-shape. And if it's more V-shaped, um, 
then it's inside out. And the other thing is uh, um, that, you know, it may look blurry, but I've got two different prescriptions here. So if I close my right eye and try and read that screen, I can't read it. And I can read it fine with my right, but I think the right is distance and the left one is for close up. So that's why I was trying to read something small with my left eye. And it kind of looks clear to me, so I think it's okay, but I'm going to just go a little bit longer. We'll see. It's not painful. It's just irritating. And because I'm still new to this, you have to give your, like the first day I had the contacts in for four hours, yesterday six hours, today's supposed to be eight hours. Um, and I just put them in just before I got started. Glasses are better because glasses don't tear. Well, my problem with glasses is primarily when I need to see or have a difficult time seeing is somewhere that's not very well lit and the, and the font or the print is small. So like a restaurant, reading a menu, uh, paying the bill, and I don't have the glasses with me and I don't want to wear them around my neck like an old man. I don't like that look. So having the contacts means I'll have it with me all the time and I should be just sort of going back to the way it's always been prior to my vision starting to degenerate. But uh, it's an experiment. They may not work. I may not like them. This is all just a new thing for me. I was thinking I may have to get some colored contacts. So at least I can tell if I've got them in or not. Sometimes it's hard to tell if the contact is even in my eye. I'm sitting there struggling. Uh, trying to figure out, did I drop it or is it in my eye? And I think if I got some color, something would indicate to me that I've got it in place. So, Oyvind Wethal has contributed 100 Norwegian krona again. He says, computer wizards look good with glasses. You don't need lenses, Carrie. <laughs> Just the frames. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure my left eye looks a little red because I was... Uh, like the right eye went right in, no problem. First time I've ever done that. And the left eye kept messing with it. I actually took the contact lens out because it felt weird and I tried to flip it inside out and went to put it back in and it flipped back the other way. So then I was like, all right. You know, I rinsed it back in the solution and took it back out again and flipped it. And then I couldn't remember which, which way was it flipped before. And then I just kind of looked at it, and, and then I flipped it back the other way, and it flips back on its own. And I assume if it's flipping back on its own, that must be the right way. And then that's how I uh, put it in. So I think I've got it right. I tried putting it in, flipped the other way, and as I was pushing it on, it flipped back around my finger. So I'm like, all right, that's, it's got to be the other way. I don't know. All new experience. Never had, never in my life have I been intentionally putting my fingers in my eyes. It's weird. It's really weird. Are they so unnoticeable in your eye you forget wearing it? Uh, that is my concern, that I will forget to take them out. Not that that's the worst thing that can happen, but... But... Uh, Linda says she's got allergies, and you may too. I don't think I've got it. You know, I wore them all day yesterday. It was fine. But who knows? As far as I know, I don't have any allergies to nothing. But uh, that can always change. Okay, so... Let me start by getting things prepped here and of talking about my personal life. And in fact, the more I'm focusing on doing this work, the, um, the less the eyes bother me. So I think it's, it's probably just settling. We'll see, no big deal. If it's painful, I'll take it out. But right now, it's just that the, the right eye, I can't even, it doesn't feel any different with or without the contact lens. The left eye um, is a little irritated.
rinse the left one in fluid. Yeah, I did that. You know, I was, I was taking the contact lens, you know, trying to put it in, and it would fall, and then I've got a little paper towel, and fall on a paper towel, and I've got the little thing, and I'd rinse it off and put it back and, and try that. And uh, uh, But it, obviously, if I have to take it out, I will obviously put it back in, in the solution again. Carrie, you could always resort to an eye patch. Yar, I am a vast and I'm here to pirate your data. Yar. If it's shaped like a bowl, it's the correct way. And if it's shaped like a saucer, it's backward. You know, from all I can tell, it looks exactly the same. When it flips, it looks like this. And when it flips the other way, it looks like this. I can't see any, like, I thought it would be sort of, you know, the edges would poke out this way versus be in. It looks exactly the same to my untrained eye, because I don't know what exactly I'm looking for. Either way looks right. It sits, it appears to sit exactly the same, so. But I can tell you that when I flipped it the other way and tried to put it in, it flipped back the other way around my finger. And that suggests to me that's probably the default. If it has a, a natural inclination to bend more one way than the other, that would seem logical to me that that would be the proper way, you know, the, the direction it's naturally wanting to go. I don't know. I don't know. Do you need to put them every day in the solution? Yeah, yeah, so there's a little contact lens holder. You take them out at night, stick them in there. Yep. Michael Martin says you need contacts to see your contacts. That's exactly right. Yeah, how's my eye? Michael says, thanks, Kerry. Just got the optimizer. Right on, Michael. Thanks for supporting the channel. Put your glasses on to see your contacts. Merrick uses dailies and does well. So dailies are what you wear them once and throw them away. Is that what a daily is? These are supposed to be good for like 30 days. What's your record on building a PC? Uh, six minutes. I think was, well, I did a, a the Consumer Electronics Show. Tiger Direct used to run a PC building contest with journalists, so I wasn't exactly up against uh, other techs, although some of the journalists were techs. And the guy who beat me, beat me by six, uh, six seconds, or was less than six seconds. And you're supposed to have put the panels back on before you hit the power switch, and he did not do that. He, he hit his power switch. And then he put the panels on where the system was booting, and I didn't say anything because it's all for charity. But I was a second place winner in the PC build race. You can see how I cherish this by covering it with dust. Oh my gosh, was that 12 years ago already? I'm probably not that fast anymore. How did that be 12 years? Felt like it was maybe seven or eight years ago. <clears throat> but you know, for me, building a PC fast is not as enjoyable. It's stressful. I want to enjoy the process, I want to savor it. Because I'm twisted like that. And I think most people will agree, after you've built your first computer, you will want to build another one. Um, so I suggest you take your time and enjoy all of it. Savor it. It's expensive. <laughs> most of us can't afford to do it that often. What was your slowest build? The Xenos computer is my slowest build. I'm on my third attempt of uh, building in that now. And it's no fault of, uh, of Xenos. It's not a fault of the case. 
but rather uh, I had very high expectations for the way I wanted to film it. I wanted it to be more along the lines of what you might see from a corporation versus a guy in his kitchen. And just don't have the right lighting, I don't have enough camera people, doing it by myself was just, it's impossible. I can't do it by myself. And then getting people to help, um, sometimes somebody's available, somebody else isn't. So one day one person's using the camera, another day someone else is using it and it results in completely different uh, footage. And when I play the footage back, I'm, I was like, well, maybe I can fix this in post, you know, but I'm not that good as an editor to be able to do that either. And so days turn to weeks, weeks turn to months. The parts become very old and I feel that they don't, they're not up to the caliber of the case, that the case deserves something much more modern. And I've taken too long with the parts I had and so I end up uh, using those parts for the machine that's doing the editing now. Uh, and then I've got all new parts again and start the process again and just do it live like I do all my other builds. Which ultimately the case creator was all he wanted to begin with, but I really wanted something like over the top. But it's just, it's too much time. It's just too much time. So that'll be my longest build. But when it's done, I think it's gonna be mind blowing. And uh, I'm, you see me looking off to the side, I'm looking at it, it makes me smile. I just, I know what the potential is there and I'm this close, you know? So uh, we will get back to it here uh, before too long. I think I'll probably finish up the 3950X first and then come back to the Xenos after that. Was there any build that you hated doing? You know, sometimes I get frustrated uh, with certain cases or certain parts configurations, but ultimately that's me facing a challenge and I feel really good when I've overcome the challenge. So sometimes some of the more difficult builds that you, know, you might see me getting frustrated on video ultimately are the most rewarding when they're done and they look fantastic and they look great and I'm just like, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> but, you know, in the end, it, it, it's totally worth it. And that keeps it interesting, you know. Not everything should be easy or I probably wouldn't be bothered to do it. Did you build over a thousand PCs over your career? I built over 30,000 PCs in my career. We used to build, um, when I worked at TriStar, we were pushing out like 60 or 70 a day, and I think I did probably, mm, probably at least three a day, five days a week, 50 weeks a year. So just that first year, that was uh, three times 50 is 150. And I, and I did that for the first three or four years. So in my first three or four years, I built a thousand computers easily. And then since then, it, it's really hard to say, but it, it may not be 30,000, but it's over, it, it's somewhere between 10,000 and 30,000. It's really hard to know. It's really hard to know. It, it's a lot though. There's a lot of computers, not to mention the repairs and the upgrades and everything else. So it's, um, I don't know. I know it's more than 10,000. Maybe I'll just leave it at that. Have you tried the Pickle Rick Pringles yet? That sounds disgusting. Linda's telling me the wear once and throw away is the best contact lenses for new contact lens wearers. Mm, that's not what they told me at America's Best. But I, I'll, t I'll ask them about it on Monday, so thank you for bringing that up. Laser eye surgery? No. There's been too many suicides after LASIK. Um, I know that they say it's, it's rare, but the fact that there's any at all, there was a 
an anchor person for a Detroit news station that made a, a lot of press when she committed suicide. And uh, a lot of it had to deal with this extreme pain that she had from uh, LASIK, and there's something else, what's it called? Uh, smile, something like that, that has to do with uh, the type of eye surgery. And the fact that it's even possible to, even if it's unlikely, it's possible, just immediately turns me off to that. Have you found any new cases if the 200R goes away, Bruce wants to know. Well, the 200R is not going away. Uh, the Be Quiet Pure Base 500 and 600 uh, would be good without the window for clients that, um, either way, if they need an optical drive, they'd go to the 600. If they don't need the optical drive or anything on the front, we could go to the, to the 500, although the 500 lacks the hard drive LED and the reset switch. I'll take it back. The Pure Base 600 is close, but not quite what I would use. But I could use it if I, if I had to. Uh, that would be a, a quick go-to for me. But the 200R is still made. It's still widely available, and there's no concern about it going away. There's a big internet rumor about it, and it just kind of got out of control. They're widely available, and you can check for yourself. They're Price went up a little bit on them, but there's still a bargain. Okay, I was just looking through the comments to make sure I wasn't missing anything there, and I guess I can start to prep the board. So for this, I'm gonna go ahead and move the camera up a little bit closer here so you guys can see better. So hang on for a moment as we go for a little ride. Cog Jin has contributed 10 pounds, that I also donated blood today. Right on. Thank you for supporting the channel. All right. Okay, so I guess the first thing I'm going to do is put the CPU in, which I have right here.
There's our documentation with the Go Faster sticker. We'll set that over there for now. And on this side is our CPU, which we should be able to just slide out of the top, I think. Little gold triangle right down there. Open up the socket. There's a little indication on this corner. The CPU can only go in one way. So I'll just set that gently down into the socket. I just let gravity sort of take it once I put one side in and then I give it a little wiggle on the edges. I try to avoid touching the top. Then we'll close that back down and that little plastic piece will pop up on its own. I will put a hand on the I.O. shield here to hold the motherboard in place while I put this pressure on it. Ooh, that popped up good. Save that. Let's put the NVMe drive in. This is the Samsung 970 Evo Plus. These things, like I said, I think this customer paid $430 for this, and now they're $573, I think, on Amazon. It's a ridiculous price. Not worth $573, and I don't know who in their right mind would pay that, but some people have a lot more money than I do. <laughs> That's very obvious to me anyway. And I'm going to place it right up here on this top socket, so for that I'm going to use my JIS screwdriver right here, and the link for this driver is in the uh, Amazon store in the links below this video. It's made by Hosan or Hosen, however it's pronounced. Well, this is interesting. That is a little teeny tiny standoff right there. I mean, it's tiny. I expected it to be a bit taller than that, but I guess that's all it needs. This standoff is much taller on this side. Oh, but this is raised up. This socket is raised up. This one, this socket's closer to the surface. Interesting. Okay, so we'll take the gum stick drive out here. This is the 970 Evo Plus. And with the label facing up, we'll install it into the socket like so. That looks good. And put the screw down. Don't over tighten it. And then inside of here, is our documentation. So we'll put that aside. Time to prep for the cooler. Let's back this up a little bit. It seems a little bit tight there. Okay, let's open this up. in there. I got a box for you, Lyle. Nothing else in there. There's the screwdriver that comes with the Mugen 5. There's the back plate we need. 
These curved brackets are for AMD, which we are not using AMD today, but the customer might want to switch the cooler to, who knows, maybe another machine or switch to AMD. So we give the customer all the spare parts. You don't really get spare parts when you buy from a pre-built manufacturer. So that's sort of the benefit when you build your own, or in my case, have me build it, is you have lots of opportunity for upgrades. This is screws and pads, uh, spacers and little rubber pads for an extra fan, which we're not adding. And in this bag, if I can get it open, We're going to take out the four screws that hold the brackets down right there and four of the large or tall standoffs. The short standoffs, the shorter standoffs right here on, the, on your left, these are for socket 2011 or 2066. So we want these big ones for this build today. Any socket 1151 build would use those. And of course, if the customer wanted to move this cooler over to a socket 2011 or 2066, they get all those spare parts that they can do that with. And, and I'm gonna grab a little Ziploc bag because what I like to do is keep the cooler parts separate from all the other spare parts. And I'll put the documentation in there so it's in case you're wondering, if the customer gets this and they're like, what's this? Won't take much to know that that's spare cooler parts since the cooler directions are in there, right? Seems logical to me anyway. Man, it's almost two o'clock already. So to begin this cooler install, I want to get this bracket on, and the bracket has, oh sorry, I got my wrong video up, hold on a second, bear with me for a minute here, there it is. So the bracket has foam pads on one side, make sure the foam pads go up against the back of your motherboard, don't put metal up against the back of your motherboard, whatever you do. And I love that that's metal and not plastic, which I've discussed in uh, previous builds with Liquid coolers often have those plastic uh, back plates. And then what I'm going to do is, once again, pay attention to how I hold my parts. If you hold your parts the exact same way you see me do it, then you will not need to wear an anti-static wrist strap. Although, if you want to wear one, it certainly doesn't hurt. You'll notice there's two holes at the top of the bracket. Well, I guess it could be the side or the bottom, depending on how you're holding the bracket. But it's going to align with the two screws here. There's two on the top and one on the bottom. That's just going to go right over that. And then there's three little screw holes in each corner of this bracket. And we're, for this socket, going to use the center hole. And the way I'm going to do that is grab one of these standoffs right here. And I'm going to come around to this side and find the mounting hole next to the CPU and make sure it aligns with the center hole. And we'll give that just a couple of turns to get it started. And then I'm going to do the same thing in the opposite corner. And what that's going to do is it's going to align the other two automatically so I don't have to work with the board upside down. Once I put this last one in and ensure that I'm going into the center hole. 
So close. Seems to be going in there now. We're not. <laughs> so what happens when I let go of that bracket, you'll see that bracket swings all over the place. That's why it's important to do those two opposite corners first. And keep them rarely, uh, fairly loose so that we can still move the bracket if need be to get the other two started. And then you'll see those went in super easy because they're already aligned. And now we can use the included uh, Phillips number two magnetized driver that Scythe gives you with the cooler. And we can start tightening these down. Now I can put the brackets on. We'll put one bracket there, and the other bracket goes there. It's very easy to put these brackets on upside down or sideways, right? That wouldn't go on this way. It follows it go, uh, the same direction as that lever I lifted. It goes over that, and the other one matches it on the other side, so that keeps that simple. And again, I can use the included driver. And there are elongated holes on these brackets, and those are there to accommodate different socket sizes. And on the socket 1151, we're going to go to the, the, the hole nearest to the edges and closest to the CPU. like that. And that preps the uh, base for the cooler, so the cooler is just going to uh, go on, and then there's two screws that lock down, and it's super easy to put that on. We can put our RAM in. We're going to use the two gray sockets first, opening up the retention levers on both sides. There's a little plastic over company logos on just about every piece of hardware you'll ever buy. And if you leave it on, it doesn't hurt anything in most cases, but it will yellow and start to bubble up over time, and it just looks terrible. The RAM will only go in in one direction, and the slot will align with the notch in the um, memory slot. And I use my thumbs to just push down one side and then the other side. And repeat that skipping a slot. I like how Gigabyte um, gives you different color slots so you know which two to use. But generally speaking, on any modern board using DDR4 RAM, if you have more than two sockets for RAM, you skip a socket, regardless of where you start. But always refer to your motherboard manual if you're only using two of the four sockets 
to know which two they recommend. It'll work either way. It'll just work better if you do it the way they suggest. Okay, so that's our motherboard prepped. That's got our M2 drive in there, two terabytes, super fast storage, 32 gigs of RAM, a Core i7 9700K, ninth generation processor, eighth generation board. But as we talked about before, this $99 board, the ones I've been getting from Amazon already have the latest BIOS. You have to have the latest BIOS for the ninth gen chips to work. If you don't, uh, what will happen is you'll turn the machine on and it just won't post. The fans will run, the lights will come on, and nothing happens. And the only way around that is to get an older CPU and, and uh, borrow it from somebody so you can flash it. But um, the inventory seems like it's pretty new inventory, at least from Amazon. Everything I've been getting has the latest BIOS on it, which I think is F14, if memory serves. Now we can prep the case. So let me move this camera back. So hold on a minute, guys. We're going to move this around a little bit. Tell you what, we'll do something a little different today. We'll keep it a little closer than I normally have it. And let me move these empty boxes. And the documentation can get moved as well. Put this over here. And then we've got documentation for the case. We'll keep that over here. All this documentation is going to go to the customer. We don't need any of that. This is just good old doorstop right here. Jam it right under there, keep that from spinning. got a box of hardware that comes with the case. This has all of the screws and uh, there's a couple nylon zip ties in there and everything that we would need to mount drives and motherboard and whatnot into the case. So that's all right in there. Nothing else in there. As for the screws, Actually, most of these we're not using. There's some extra standoffs we don't need. There's some fan screws we don't need. There's another bag of fan screws we don't need. So all this can go oh, with, the, with the documentation and the spare parts. The nylon zip ties, we won't need those for a few minutes. So we'll put those over here for now. And that just leaves two bags. And uh, we'll get to those here in a minute. I'm going to go ahead and put the optical drive in. So to do that, I'm going to pop out one of these bays. It doesn't matter if you want to put it in the top one or the lower one. I like the look of using the top area. So just push that out, grab the optical drive here. This is an OEM optical drive. It doesn't come in a retail box. There's no directions. This is for people that want to save money who ultimately don't need the box and the directions that ends up in the landfill. You can save a few bucks. Some people get concerned because they think this looks used. But no, this is sold in a big crate. And what Amazon is doing is they're taking them out of the crate and selling them one by one. They're really intended to be sold as a crate for people like Dell and HP that go through, you know, a thousand of them a day or whatever. But that's all there is to that. And it's just going to slide right in from the front and it will lock. There's a little lever right here and it's going to lock into position. That little lever should sink in. There it goes. And that locks it. Now, if I want to make sure that it won't come free in shipping, like if I wasn't shipping it, I wouldn't, it's not going anywhere. But I can put 
that these, uh, in this bag, there's some thin thread or fine threaded screws. And I can put one of these really fine threaded screws right here on this lower front right there, and then come around and do the same thing on the other side. That's it. So optical drive is in, and it ain't going nowhere. And that's pretty much all we're going to use these screws for. The other piece of hardware you would use these fine threaded screws for would be to secure any two and a half inch solid state drives here. This top part, the drives will lock in without any tools, both three and a half inch drives and two and a half inch drives, but we're not using either of those on this build since we're going with the M2 drive. But the customer could certainly uh, add that in the future if they want to very easily. I can also put the I.O. shield in. I've got the I.O. shield right here. This comes with your motherboard. So we'll just grab some scissors and get it out of here. And with the six small holes facing down, at least with the 200R, it's going to fit right in. And people that are building computers for the first time typically struggle with this. Sometimes you'll get one corner in and the other corners pop out. It's just something that takes practice and it's not a big deal, you know, if you make a mistake or you put it in upside down, whatever, it's just pop it out. Be patient. Enjoy your build. I'm telling you, man. It's, you're gonna want to do it again. Okay, so now we can put the power supply in. So this is the uh, the EVGA six hundred gold. Uh, 600 watts is more than enough power. The system will probably use somewhere around 400 watts when it's really pushed hard with that graphics card. So that still gives us 200 watts overhead for additional upgrades, any additional hardware, drives, other things the uh, customer may want to add in the future. They won't have to worry about changing out a power supply. This is a, a lot of times where you get cut short on the big name manufacturers. They only give you quite often the size power supply that that specific configuration requires. And the minute you add something to it, your power supply no longer has enough juice. So EVGA has included silver screws, which bothers me. That really bothers me when they do that. We've got our power cable. I'll set that aside with the documentation. Customer will get that. I use my own power cable when I test machines. That way it keeps the customer's power cable neatly folded, you know? It's always hard to put it back the way the manufacturers get it done. But it's a pretty short power supply. There's all your specs right there. And that's going to go with the fan facing down. There's no logo that we have to worry about, any plastic over that. And of course, we're done with this box. So we'll just set that aside for Lyle. So again, with the fan facing down, there's a little metal flap here, and it's going to go underneath of that flap, rest it down again with the fan down, and push it so that it goes up against this motherboard tray. Then slide it back so that it'll be flush like that, and then we can secure it with the four screws, but it's a black case, and it kind of bothers me that the I.O. shield's silver, but it's a $100 motherboard. And look, the color of the screws ultimately probably doesn't matter to most normal people, but it matters to me. So I am going to uh, grab some black screws. Even the screws, like these little shallow screws that come with the case would work to hold the power supply in. But I've got some proper black screws that are the same design. And I ordered a bag of them off of Amazon because I kept running into this problem. 
And they're just standard hex head um, case screws, very commonly used in building computers. And they're pretty inexpensive, and the link for it is in my Amazon store. But this is what that bag looks like. A bunch of, com of the black computer screws in there. And you can imagine, I can put a lot of power supplies in before I'll have to buy any more. I think there's a hundred of them in there, so I'm just using them four at a time. Once I have them all started, now I can tighten them down. The screwdriver has a clutch on it, which turns the driver off when it hits a certain torque setting. And I've got it set right now to just three. And then what I'll do is I will put the screwdriver in locked mode, which doesn't allow the spindle to turn. And then I can turn this just like any other manual screwdriver to just give that power supply a little more, um, to secure it just a little better. Because again, I am shipping this. If I wasn't going to ship it, it would have been fine just the way it was. But I don't want the screws to vibrate out or the power supply to come free in shipping, or it will potentially bounce around in here and damage everything exposed, which would be the motherboard and the cooler and the RAM. And yeah, it gets real expensive real quick. Then I can put these away for another day. Oh no, I only have that many left. Like I said, this exact bag of screws uh, I purchased from Amazon and the link for it is in my Amazon link. It'll say, below the video it says something like, if you wanna purchase the things you see in the video, click here and there's like 100, 105, 110 items from things you'll see, not just on this build, but on repairs and other videos that I make with equipment that I've purchased from Amazon. Because everybody always asks, where'd you get this and where'd you get that? Of course, if you make a purchase using my Amazon link, I get a small commission from that as well. And it's a great way to show support for the channel. Looks like a couple contributions came in that I missed, so let me give some shouts out to these generous folks here. What do we have? Can an i9 9900K and a 1060 boot with a 600 watt power supply? Of course it can. Yeah, you probably won't even draw, you probably won't even draw 400 watts from that. Mahdi has contributed $5 and says, hello, hey Mahdi, good to see you, my friend. Thank you for your continued support, of course. And we have exactly 1,000 people watching live right now. We'll give a couple more shots out. Bearpaw has contributed two pounds and said, I just ordered the Samsung 970 Evo Plus two terabyte for 399 pounds. Yeah, it sounds like a good deal. David Santiago has contributed $2. And Cogjen has contributed 10 pounds. Scott Weaver contributed 10 Australian dollars. He says, I feel your pain, Carrie. Oh, we're talking about my eye, huh? And uh, John Craig contributed 10 pounds. He says, just a bit of support. How is the studio search going? I'm waiting to hear back about this house rental. Uh, Rick Hubbard contributed three pounds. Dimitri's con contributed 15 euro. He says, keep up all the good work you do on this channel. Thank you, Dimitri. Michael Martin's contributed two pounds. He goes, hi, Carrie, here's a small donation in support. And Glenn Davies has contributed two Australian dollars. It says, just visiting briefly between blue screens of death. That's usually bad RAM that causes that. Uh, even if your RAM passes the Memtest 86, it doesn't mean your RAM is good. So I would take some RAM out all but one stick 
and then see if the computer continues to blue screen. And if it does, take that one stick out and put a different stick back in and see if it continues to blue screen. And if it does, it's probably not RAM, but that's a good way to test it. Hugh Wong has contributed $5.23. He says, I'm at work. I stepped out to contribute. Great content, Carrie. Thank you, Hugh. And I see Brendan Looney put a link to the Amazon shop that I've got. Uh, thank you, Brendan, for doing that. Andrew Lipinski has contributed $1.99. He says, how are you, Carrie? I'm, I'm doing great, Guilfoyle. I swear his picture, his profile picture looks like Guilfoyle. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, um, helping to keep me sponsor free. My energy drink is kicked in today, and if I'm talking quickly, it's because I'm both in a hurry, <laughs> which I shouldn't be, and I got this new energy drink. You know, if you've been watching the channel for a while, I know this guy, his name is uh, Jamie with a Y, is what he'll tell you. And Jamie has a uh, energy drink called cocaine. It, it, most stores won't carry it. You have to order it online. I think it's uh, drinkcocaine.com or something is the website. But I found these energy drinks are just too much to drink. I mean, you see how long it takes me to just nurse a 12 ounce can of Coca-Cola. So I like the little energy shots. And I haven't had this today. My energy is coming from some a different energy drink. But I, I noticed that um, he came out with the little energy shots of cocaine, which is, uh, I don't know, it's the strength of the caffeine in this. But I thought I'd give it a shot. And there's a little message down here, if you, if you can read it. I don't know if you guys can read that. This message is for the people. You know what? I, I, I'll still have to get glasses to read that because it's too tiny. So how about glasses on top of contacts? How's that going to work? This message is for the people who are too stupid to recognize the obvious. This product does not contain the drug cocaine. And in parentheses it says, duh. This product is not intended to be an alternative to an illicit street drug. And anyone who thinks otherwise is an idiot. <laughs> Oh man, Jamie's a cool dude. Cool dude. So uh, I'll try this tomorrow. We'll see if it's any good. I certainly don't need it today. That much I know. Yeah, I like Jamie. He's a cool dude. Yeah, there it is, uh, drinkcocaine.com, and there's a link for it. I'll just put that right here in the chat room for you guys if you want to check it out. It's interesting, though, because I got that off Amazon. I stumbled on it. I wasn't aware Jamie came out with the energy shots. All I've seen are the cans, and I've had the cans here. Oh, he's got a black can. So he's had the red can and the blue can, but what's the black one? I don't know what flavor that's supposed to be. He's got a, a YouTube video of someone reviewing it. But um, I, I have to talk to Jamie. It's been too long since we spoke. But yeah, I ordered it off Amazon. <clears throat> now, when it comes to putting the board in, because I think I'm ready now to put the motherboard into the case.
I will probably, oh no, I'm going to leave the heat sink off. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave the heat sink off so I can get that eight pin. You see right up, right up here in this top corner, there is, I keep moving my mouse around. Hold on a minute, guys. So right up here, pretty much on every board, is the power connector for your CPU. And when I put the heat sink on, with this case being as short as it is, there's no room for me to get my hands in there to connect that cable. So I either have to put the cable on now and then put the motherboard, you know, secure it down, or that's if the heat sink was on it already, or I leave the heat sink off of it. And remember, keep in mind how I'm holding this board. You'll see I'm not touching anything on the back, and that's why an anti-static strap isn't necessary. If I get a static discharge onto these metal I.O. ports here, these are all grounded, it doesn't matter. And uh, as far as the edge goes, there's, there's nothing metal on the edge for, for there to be a static discharge. <clears throat> but again, if you, if you want to wear an anti-static strap, I'm not discouraging you from it. But some people think that static isn't something you can control. And that if you don't wear an anti-static strap, you're automatically uh, creating uh, static with the parts. But the important thing is how you handle the parts. So if you handle the parts properly, you don't have to worry about static to begin with. So to do this, I'm going to lay the case flat. And I'm going to grab this board, and we're going to set it in so the I.O. ports are going to face the I.O. shield. Get this fan power cable out of the way, and then I'll just slide this in. Pretty good. I want to check right up through here, make sure everything's lining up properly. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to push the board towards, well, towards you. So I'm going to force these components to go through these holes. And the board's going to move forward just a little bit. And the, the mounting hole here should align with the middle standoff that's just a post and should hold the board in place. But I just realized, because I keep forgetting, that. These gigabyte boards have that extra mounting hole that the case does not support. I've never seen a case support it. And you can ignore it. You don't have to use it. But I've got these little plastic standoffs that we used to use on motherboards back in the 90s, and I've got a big tray of them. And this gives me a good excuse to use them. <laughs> Otherwise, they're going to sit in here for 10 more years. So, um, uh, you know, one at a time. <laughs> I'll have to install a lot of these boards before I get rid of all of them, but one at a time, we will use one standoff. Uh, again, only because I've got them hanging around. This is not required, but I'm going to place it into the unused hole that the case does not support on the motherboard, which is right here on the board. This, this hole all the way, well, the way I'm holding it makes it hard for you guys to see. This hole right down here, this is not standard. Usually you'll have three in a row, one, two, and three, and one, two, and three. Sometimes you'll go three this way, one, two, and three on a bigger board, one, two, and three, and one, two, and three, and all three will be in alignment. This one that stands all on its own right there, it's just not used by any case manufacturer I've ever built in. So I don't know what Gigabyte's thinking. So I have these little plastic standoffs left over from the 90s, and it can go into that hole right there. And that gives us just a little added support. It is not required. You do not, please don't feel like you have to order those off Amazon. You do not have to, just ignore it. Now the Corsair 200R already has the standoffs in the right position for the motherboards that you see me use. If you're using different parts in your build, specifically a different motherboard or a different case, be sure that the standoffs in the case align with the holes on the motherboard. If you've got a standoff where there's not a hole on the motherboard, you can't see it once the motherboard is in position and it can ground out against the components on the back of the board and cause a short and damage the component, which would not be a warranty issue. That's not a defect in workmanship or material. That's a defect in the person who installed it not paying attention. 
So one of the simplest ways that you can know if you have a standoff uh, in the wrong place is to simply count how many standoffs you have and count how many holes in the motherboard you have. Those numbers should be the same. And then of course, once you align the board as I'm about to do now, so once again, we'll make sure everything's aligned here. And then I'll push it forward and then it seats down. Make sure that there's no metal tabs or grounding tabs coming over like that one right there usually gives me grief. That looks okay now, I think. Or, it, or does it? Hold on, now I'm not sure. Let me take this back out and take another look at what's going on right there. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, perfect. So let me put it back in. So again, I align it, align the ports with the holes, then push the board towards you and it seats down onto that center standoff, which is just a post. And then once again, double check that none of the metal grounding straps, some IO shields have no grounding straps. Sometimes they have a foil backing and other ones like this one, they have one right here. Make sure that it hasn't bent down and is blocking that port or you'll have to take the whole board back out again. Now, using these, this bag of screws, which looks similar to the other bag, but the threads on it are more coarse. I need, let's see, one, two, three, four, five screws. So there were six mounting, well, there were seven mounting holes. One, the case doesn't support. The middle one is a post that's holding the board in position for us. And that leaves five that we can use to secure the board to the case. So I'll pull out five screws. I recommend you turn these all by hand unless you are an experienced builder, in which case I don't know why you're watching me. <laughs> but I'm glad you're here. that mounts our board into the case and currently looks just like that. I don't need any more of these screws. The rest of these screws would be used for like securing a three and a half inch hard drive. And um, you could use them to mount the power supply if you needed to. And that will go over here, the rest of the spare parts and documentation. Now there's two things on this motherboard that I'm going to have very difficult access to get a hold of once that heat sinks in place. For this motherboard, it's that 8-pin connector I have already talked about right up in this corner. And then next to it is a CPU, um, is a case fan header. So if I can hook this up right now. So the first thing I want to do is go ahead and zip tie this cable because again, that will also be very difficult to try and cable manage after the fact. Once the heat sinks in place, it'll block access to it. I can pretty much keep it the way Corsair's got it here. Or I can improve it a little bit, make it look a little bit better. Take the wire tie off of it. You don't want any wire ties in your build when you're done because they contain wire. And when it gets brittle, it'll break and it'll float around inside of your case. Try 
Trying to see what Corsair was doing here with this cable management. It's kind of funky. Some people have said, you know, we can only see your back. Why don't you work on the other side of the table? Well, if I work on the other side of the table, I'm not exactly sure what you're going to see when I get my hands in here and I'm doing this. You know, given a choice between the two, the only alternative is to get somebody to work the cameras to work around me. But I'm doing the best I can and trying to show you guys as much as possible. But I, I have to tell you, it's far more difficult to build a computer when you're trying to work at weird angles to get uh, a good view from the camera, you know, because the camera is not moving, I have to move to it. And that does add to the complexity and the time it takes to build. And somebody who's never done it before uh, doesn't appreciate, in most cases, they don't appreciate the <laughs> how complicated it can get working backwards or sideways trying to show an angle so people can see it. And because these are actual builds going to real customers, my priority, of course, is to make sure the job gets done correctly. And if it means that you won't get a good view of a certain part, well, I've got lots of other build videos with other close-ups so that each, each individual build video doesn't have to always be the same. See, so that gets that out of the way. And then we can hook up the 8-pin CPU power cable. I guess I can go ahead and plug the motherboard power cable in now, too. wish they would stop separating out the four pin. That like keeps it backwards compatible to like 20 year old systems. I don't know why they do this anymore. It's really, really annoying. And I've got to flip it the other way because the clip is going to go to the outside edge. Oh, they put two little arrows on there. I don't know if you can see that. This is going to be another one of those where I can't do it standing at this angle. So I have to come around here like this. But that's just unnecessary to separate that four pin cable these days. It's a practice I'd like to see stop. Okay, so that's the main 24 pin power cable. And then in here somewhere I have, there it is, the in this case, it's two four pins that will push together to make one eight pin connector. And this is the time to untangle these cables. And we'll run that out right through here. the slack through and then up into this corner. And we'll pull that through here. And again, we have to push these two together with the clips facing the outside edge of the board. That's going to go right on there. And it's super easy without the heat sink in the way. Just clicks right on there. Now this cable And this cable are for your graphics card if it takes one or both. Kind of sad that, I got to tell you, I'm not going to recommend this 600 GD power supply anymore because there's no reason they can't keep both of these on the same cable to make for clean, cleaner cable management. I also don't like the silver screws. I don't know what they were thinking when they did that. I 
have to decide which way I want to run this cable. Do I want to run it over it or under it? Yeah, EVGA just kind of, they, they make a lot of different designs for power supplies. They have a, a large variety. It's not like you only have five to choose from. They probably got, I don't know, 30 or 40 to choose from. And some are just going to be um, configured better for some builds than others. And so for the kind of builds that you see me do on my channel, uh, this power supply is not ideal for the kind of builds that I do, which doesn't mean it's not good for anybody, but I won't, I won't use the uh, GD series anymore. I'm not going to do it. I was sort of sold on it based on the fact that it's gold rated for efficiency, but you know, bronze rated is still decent enough. And, and furthermore, they have other gold rated CPUs. Um, they have other gold rated power supplies, rather, PSUs where it does come with black screws and this power cable will be on, you know, it'll provide both VGA power off one cable. There might be some benefit to that if you're drawing a ton of power and overclocking or something, but for my customers and my builds, it just doesn't make sense. Again, not a showstopper. Just a preference. All I'm trying to do now is get these cables untangled so it looks nice. And these cables are way too long. I mean, they can pretty much reach out and touch you. I mean, that's crazy to have cables that long. That's a pain to manage those. And most power supplies would only have three SATA connectors on a cable. This has got one, two, three, four, five. And they've combined a Molex and a three pin at the end of that, which I can almost guarantee you're not going to use. So that just ends up being, and it, they put it at the end, which is the worst place, because if you use this connector first <laughs> in order to cable manage and hide most of your cabling, then you have to do something with this. Uh, John Zeno's had the idea of just taking and cutting these wires off with some wire cutters and then just put some black tape around it and just get rid of that altogether. And then that would leave you with your standard three connectors there. And then they did it again on this one where you've got one, two, three SATA and two Molex. Um, I would think that that's a lot to draw if you used all five of these. Yet it'd be too much to draw to put these two on one. Like to me that's completely backwards from the design that I would have done and that I'm accustomed to seeing even from EVGA themselves but not on this GD series. So no more GD series for Carrie's builds. I gotta remember that. If you see another GD series, it's because I forgot. Note to self, no more GD series. Here I thought GD was short for gold, but I think it stands for something else now. So how I feel when I was looking at this cable management system here. Another, another two words came to mind, GD. There's our front port audio cable. We can run that down right through here because that is a short power supply, which I like for that very reason right there. Helps hide the cable management. And that only goes on in one direction. And we just kind of wiggle it and push on it until it bottoms out against the board. And that's all that holds it in place, just friction. There's no clip. 
We've got the um, USB 3.0. This cable connects to the board and enables these two front USB ports right up here. I'm trying to figure out how they twisted this. Well, I'll worry about cleaning that up later, but we'll just get it plugged in for now. Are we going on that one or that one? We'll go down the second one here. Bring that around. Only goes in one direction, and that's going to go. Again, I kind of wiggle it up and down and push, and it sort of locks in there. But that's going to be a pain in the butt, the way that they cabled that. In the factory, when they did this at the factory, they just didn't seem to care too much. But nylon zip ties will clean that up later. I just want to get to a point where I can test fire this. So now I've got the front port umbilicals, which is the power LED, hard drive LED, power, set, uh, power switch and reset switch. And I'll bring those down right under here. see the hard drive LED goes on first right down here on these last two pins on the bottom row and the power LED goes on just above that one and in both cases you want the positive wire going to the left side closest to the edge of that connector so like I said the hard drive LED on the bottom row of the first two pins, the power LED on the top row, first two pins. And then what else do we have here? Just want to untangle that. Which one do I have? Let's do the reset switch next. So the reset switch right here goes right beside the hard drive LED on that bottom row, the next two pins. There's no positive or negative. It says positive and negative, but just ignore it. It doesn't matter. I just put it with the words facing up. And on the Corsair 200R, the hard drive LED has to go with the words facing down in order for the positive to line up. But everything else um, with the words facing up, which makes it easier for another person or even myself to look at this machine in the future and be able to read the words without having to pull the connector off. So this is the power switch. It's going to go right above the reset switch, right next to the power LED. And that's it. So that's hooked up all the front port umbilicals. That's all done. All I have to do now is put the heat sink on it, which of course requires some thermal compound. And uh, once we secure that in place, we can test fire this, and do our first boot. Once again, you'll see me apply thermal compound a bit differently than the hobbyists and enthusiasts you see on YouTube. I do this because I have to support the computers for customers, and I have to use a process that is um, going to ensure that the entire surface of the CPU is covered in thermal paste. Obviously, um, it can hurt to use too little, and it can hurt to use too much. 
I like that Scythe gives us way more than we need in this tube. And I'll just put a little dab on there, like so. And then I'm just going to finger paint the thermal paste so that I can no longer see the top of the CPU. I don't want to be able to see any silver there. And then I'll tap on it. And what that does is it makes these little hills and valleys so that when I press down on the heatsink, you don't have to worry about any bubbles or anything like that. Not that that would matter. It's the only thing that like bubbles, air bubbles, would matter to somebody who's doing some extreme overclocking with like nitrogen or something like that. This is a, there's almost no wrong way to put thermal compound on with regards to if you want to put a dab on there, if you want to put a little, a couple of dots or a couple lines, whatever it is, it's just important that you put some on there and if you put too much on, it's messy and it won't work as well. If you put too little on, it's not like you can look underneath it to see, right? Once that heat sink goes on, I don't know if my thermal compound spread out properly or not. If it oozes out the sides, I definitely know I put too much on. So doing it this way, I have peace of mind knowing that the, the coverage on the CPU is equal and it's not too much, it's not too little. And by using a nitrile glove, not a latex glove and not a rubber glove, but nitrile, um, I keep everything clean from any contamination from oils on the skin or any sort of debris. And that thermal compound is sort of a pain when you get it on your fingers. It's tough to get off. It'll be on there for like a day. I'll wash them and wash them and it'll still be on there. And that helps reduce that, that mess. So with the thermal compound on there, I'm going to lay this flat again. So again, you're not going to be able to see very much, but I have to do it. And on the bottom of the heat sink, there's a piece of tape. And on every cooler you install, that's not an OEM cooler, like a one that comes with your CPU. All the third party ones generally have a a cover keeping this area free of any contamination. That's to make sure your thermal compound is going to work effectively. Look, the thermal compound's gonna work even if I dip this in mud, it's still gonna work. It's just not gonna work as well. So the cleaner these surfaces are, the better it's gonna be able to do its job. Now that I've removed that, it's time to place it on. You'll notice one screw is kind of hidden underneath the heat sink, and the other screw is sticking out the side. That side faces the RAM. So I'm gonna just set it right on top of the CPU. And I will use the included driver that scythe, uh, you know, that came with the, the cooler. And I'm gonna just start by turning one screw just to, just to get it started, just like one turn. And we're gonna go through the hole in the top of the heat sink on the left side, locate the screw you can feel for it and then get that one turned a couple times and it should start. Now that one I can turn a few more times and come over here and just start alternating between both sides to ensure that we're putting um, equal pressure on both sides of the CPU. We don't want to tighten down one side and then the other. That can create a warp where the bottom of the heat sink won't meet the entire surface of the CPU evenly. So just keep going back and forth you don't have to be precise, just kind of feel for it. And then eventually, the, the screws will just come to a complete dead stop. You can't tighten them anymore, which is another thing I like about the side coolers. Some coolers, you can just sit there and crank and crank and crank on them until you break the screw or crush the motherboard. Well, that puts the cooler in place, and we have lots of thermal compound left over for other applications if you ever want to reuse the cooler or you have to take it off for some reason in the future. And this will go in the bag with the uh, extra cooler parts, right? And again, the customer will get that and the customer gets the screwdriver too. And then finally, I got to prep the fan. And so for this fan, uh, once again on all these fans, where you see these support brackets, that's where air is coming out. Where you see that center logo spinning, that's where air is being drawn in. So right now, if this fan was turned on, it'd be blowing air at my face. 
If I turn it this way, it'll be blowing air at your face. So I grab these little wire hangers and I'm thinking about how this is going to go on. I want it on this way. I want this cable. When I put this on here, I want this cable coming out of the bottom corner so I don't have to wrap it around or worry about it getting caught in the fan. So it's going to go on. Yeah, this will be good. So for me to put that on in that orientation, I got to put the wire hanger on this side like this. One there and one there. See how that looks. And the same thing on the other side. One there, one there. Now before I put this fan in, I'm going to have a real tight space here where I've got to get it plugged in and I will not be able to do any cable management. There's just no room. So I have to do it now while the fan is out. So I'll grab a couple more of these nylon zip ties that came with the case. We'll get rid of the wire tie. Don't want any wire ties in our completed build. I'll just kind of keep the cable the way the manufacturer had it, but I'll just make it look a little prettier. And I'll put one nylon zip tie here. Like so. Another one down here. Just cut these little pigtails off. And now I can take Oh, did I do this wrong? Hold on, I gotta think about this for a minute. I want this to go on this way, so that means I've got to move these. I've got them on the wrong position. So just slide these right back out. And where I really wanted this to go was up here like this. What's up, Jimmy? Stretching? Are you stretching? So now, if I want that to go on like this, yes. No, I had it right the first time. So <clears throat> what I'm thinking is I want the cable to run with as little interference to the fan header. And so to do that, the fan has to be oriented in this direction. So I had these hangers on in the correct uh, positions to begin with. But again, and I want to remind you, uh, enjoy your build. This is all part of the process. Unless you're building the same thing all the time every day, you're always going to have a little bit of a learning curve when it comes to uh, how certain parts will fit together. And there's no shame in that. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. So they're basically on the way I had them before. Yeah, that's right. And then I can plug this in right now. Probably be easier for me to do it now. And now I can align the fan in the grooves in the heat sink. 
and I'll push it down as far as it'll go to hit the top screw, the mounting screw that we just uh, tightened down. The fan will hit that. That's how I know where the bottom is. And then just pull on each hanger and it will lock into place. It's all done. We're ready for our first test boot. Not too bad, huh guys? Not too bad at all. So for that, we're going to need the power cable. We're going to need a keyboard and a mouse. Let me move this back a little bit. Plug the keyboard in up here. We're going to test this with uh, onboard video first before I plug any graphics card into it. We'll use the built-in GPU. Feels like this isn't seating all the way down the way I'd like it to. Um, let's see. I need to borrow your monitor for a minute there, guys. So we'll grab an HDMI cable. We'll run right out of HDMI here. And if everything boots up okay, we can get Windows installed. And then I can add the graphics card and hook up the optical drive in the front case fan. None of that stuff needs to happen right now. It just adds more complexity in diagnosing if it's not going to boot. And then further, if it does boot, but then after I uh, hook up the DVD and the front fan and the, op the uh, video card, if it stops booting, then I know it's one of those three things to diagnose. So it helps keep your build less frustrating when you don't try and do everything at once. We're at a point right now with the bare minimums that we can test fire this, and we should be able to get to a post screen and you know update the BIOS if need be. Let me flip the switch to the power supply on, and let's go to input number two, which is the video output of that computer. Put myself right up here in the corner, like that. Okay, here we go. I'm going to hit the power switch. Light comes on like it's supposed to. Fans are turning, both fans. have not hooked up the front fan. Now, this may take uh, up to 60, 90 seconds before anything happens on the screen. Once again, patience. Here we go. Now, it's automatically turned itself off and back on again as it's adjusting for the RAM and CPU that we've installed. So it's restarted, restarted twice. And super quiet system, which is always good. And we're just going to stay patient. You can see my hands. I'm not touching anything. So that's the third time. It's <laughs> we're going to go for four now. Here we go. All this is normal. We're going for five. There. And what's our BIOS version? I know this had to be, um, what I say, F14, I think, is the latest. Yeah, it's F14. And I can verify that. I can just type in, uh, I can go to Google on the streaming computer and type in the make of the board, which is an H370 HD3. I type the word BIOS. And the first link that comes up with Google is Gigabyte's website where they have this board product page. And if I click on the support button, I can then look for the current BIOS version, which says it is F14, which was released back in June of 2019. So we're good. We're solid on that. And since we know that that works, the next thing I can do is begin to install Windows on it. And I already have a video showing you guys how to make your own Windows 10 installation media so that you can have what I've got right here, which is 
a flash drive with the latest Windows 1909 on there. Uh, I keep moving my mouse around. Let me go back to that feed there. Okay. So yeah, this is my Windows 10 USB flash drive. And I'll just hit the power switch, shut this down, reach around here, plug it into a blue USB port, no network, no, I no internet, just keyboard, mouse, power and monitor, and the Windows 10 installation media. No other drives are installed, just the drive I want Windows 10 installed on, which in this case is the only drive this computer has. Now, without changing anything in the BIOS, leaving it just the way it came out of the box, you'll see it automatically starts booting to that flash drive and it will begin the Windows 10 installation process. I'm going to click Next and Install Now. And I'm going to click I don't have a product key. I install the product key later. It'll be for Windows 10 Pro. And then I've got to uh, answer the end user license agreement, which of course you have to accept the terms. I always choose custom install, and it only sees one drive to install on. That is the two terabyte Samsung 970 Evo Plus. Hit next, and it will automatically put four partitions, format those partitions, extract Windows 10, install Windows 10 configured for the unique hardware on this build, and it will automatically reboot until it's completed. It'll ask us a few more setup questions on the next build. And while we're waiting, I'm happy to address any questions you guys have here in the chat room and I'll get caught up with what contributions I may have missed while I've been working here. Let's take a look. I see Acronis has joined us in the chat. Welcome in, Acronis. Jesse Kirk has contributed $10. Thank you, Jesse. I see uh, Madi Uel has contributed $20 and then $10. Thank you, Madi. He says, here's for cable management. And Jesse goes, I think he meant cable control. <laughs> Mike C has contributed $2 and says, buy Linda a Coke from us. Andrew Lipinski has contributed $1.99. Hugh Wong has contributed $5.23. Uh, Mari again with $5, and then I caught up with everybody else there. So thank you guys again for supporting the channel. With 1,039 people watching live right now, why don't you give me a shout-out and tell me where you are watching me from. Kerry, have you worked out yet that RTX cards do have an SLI NVIDIA link? Are you still people you can't link to RTX? I never said you can't link to RTX cards. I never said that. What I said was, there's no point in doing it. Nobody supports it. There's the difference. Or very few things support it. There's no point in SLI. Have you worked out how to make your own videos yet? Because I haven't seen any on your channel. But thanks for criticizing me and mishearing me. That's a nasty thing to do. Basically, uh, dual video cards is dead. All right? Um, it's just not being used anymore. And of the few games that will support it, they generally don't run properly. So um, uh, the, you end up with all these issues. There's a, a great article, uh, if you Google it, that'll tell you basically that, um, I'm sure there's several articles talking about SLI and Crossfire are basically obsolete at this point. There's no real advantage to spending all this money to have nothing but problems. Look at all these people watching us around the world here. We got New York and Oregon and Liverpool in the UK, Kent in the UK and California and Florida and more in the UK. What else? Sweden, Jacob's joining us from Sweden. Mike's joining us from Montreal. One nine one by seven watching us in Croatia. All right, so this is that other um, 
the second boot on the Windows install where it finalizes these couple last questions here, and that's going to be uh, United States and U.S. keyboard. Skip that. And I'm going to say I don't have internet. Continue with limited setup. And this is going to Frank, so we'll put Frank's name in here. There we go. Carrie, does that motherboard support all three video outputs simultaneously? Uh, I know it'll support two of them. I'm not exactly sure. I never tried. And Mahdi has contributed $5. He says, good looking computer. Hey, thank you, Mahdi. Colin Bagley says, I'm watching from my sofa in England. Right on. Michael Spangard says, hello from Denmark. Nigel Barrett. Welcome in, guys. Doc Mechanic watching us in California. IZ said, I'm using two 1080 Ti's and SLI, and basically the older games like GTA 5 and Witcher 3 support it very well, but newer games like Red Dead Redemption 2 is hardly running with SLI enabled. And what I was trying to tell people is RTX is not supported um, on, on multiple... I, I'm sort of going, I'm paraphrasing here. Let me take a look at something. I just read something about this coincidentally. Uh, I think it was in Maximum PC Magazine. I think they talked about the death of SLI. So the death of SLI doesn't mean you can't use it anymore. It just means that it's pointless. It's a waste of money. Yeah, the death of multi-GPU support in gaming. And what this says, <clears throat> I'll just read the article to you. And if you guys have issue with it, you can write to the people at Maximum PC Magazine who do this for a living and you can tell them that they're wrong. Um, it says, once you buy the fastest hardware currently available, what do you do if it's still not fast enough? And that's a question we explore with the Dream Machine. Uh, sometimes doubling down on graphics cards or even quadrupling down. And if you have a pile of money burning a hole in your pocket, I want to let you in on a secret. Multi-GPU PCs are a dying breed and have been for years. Even at the height of the multi-GPU craze, getting everything to run well was a crapshoot. Two-way SLI or Crossfire might improve performance in about half of the big games. Three-way would help a few of those, and four-way was basically for 3D Mark and a handful of games. NVIDIA began downplaying anything beyond two-way SLI with its Pascal GPUs. There were ways to get three-way SLI support, but it wasn't worth the hassle. With Turing, NVIDIA killed off officially anything more than two-way SLI with its NVLink connector. AMD has likewise said little about Crossfire lately. It still exists, but almost no new games support it. So what's the deal? A 2080 Ti with over twice as many cores is up to twice as fast as an RTX 2060, so why can't two 2060s match that? Even with NVLink, the coordination of resources between GPUs happens over a comparatively slow bus. The 2080 Ti has 616 gigabits, gigabytes a second of local bandwidth, well, the NVLink tops out at 100 gigabytes a second. You understand that? I'm going to say it again. The 2080 Ti has 616 gigabytes per second of local bandwidth. Well, the NVLink tops out at only 100 gigabytes per second. All that background syncing gets messy and slows things down. Game engines are also becoming increasingly complex, and real-time lighting, shadows, and other effects require additional work. CPU and system bottlenecks show up in many games, even with the fastest CPUs. 
throw in a second GPU and a game can end up with reduced performance. An even more egregious example of how dead multi-GPU is for gaming is games with ray tracing. At maximum quality, especially at 4K, even a Titan RTX is likely to struggle, and that's only with one or two ray tracing effects. Unfortunately, no games with ray tracing even try to support more than one GPU. I'm not sure it's even possible. Theoretically it is, if a developer puts in the work, but it's definitely impractical. Even when a game tries to support dual GPUs, the results often come up short. Two recent examples are Red Dead Redemption 2 and Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Using a Core i9-9900KS with a pair of RTX 2080 Ti cards and an NVLink connector, I gave both a shot at maxed out settings in 1440p 4K. Average frame rates improved in Star Wars at 4K, but not at 1440p, but minimum frames per second did not. However, when playing the game, SLI caused massive stutters, sometimes lasting several seconds, and more frequently in combat, the worst time for that sort of behavior. Red Dead Redemption 2 was better in some ways and worse in others. There was lots of flickering initially, but restarting mostly fixed that. Performance at 1440p and 4K maximum, quality improved by about 50%, but stutters and stability were more common. This is arguably the best case for multi-GPU now, and it still isn't great. Rather than trying to max out settings and resolution with SLI or Crossfire, I find it's best to just tweak some settings and run with a single fast GPU. You might not set any benchmark records, but you'll spend more time gaming and less time fiddling and arguing with hardware. But I admit, my SLI setup is an excellent space heater. That's from Jared Walton, and that's in the, what issue is this? February 2020 issue of Maximum PC Magazine. So. Effectively, it's repeating exactly what I said, um, but people hear what they want to hear, and it's so, so annoying to me, so annoying when people don't listen. But anyway, um, let's go back to other questions. NZXT have brought out the Kraken Z63, which has a rotating logo. Ah, I was looking at that. Somebody had mentioned that the Kraken had a rotating logo, but clearly the X62 and 52 do not. But that's good to know. Ciro de Biaz, Bia, Biaze says, Carrie, I can f confirm that Uncle Carrie's Netflix works very fine in Windows 10 Pro 64-bit in Italian language. Nice. Well, thanks for letting me know. Tony Wallows contributed 99 cents. Peter Laycock has contributed 20 pounds. Hey, thank you, Peter, as always. And thank you both. Samuel Ramos has contributed $10. Here's a little something for Uncle Kerry. Hey, thank you, Samuel. SNXG God has contributed 99 cents. Hey, thank you for that. Russ says, all three headers can drive three monitors at the same time. I've got the same board. Well, there you go. So Russ says, yeah, we can, you can use all three. You can hook up three monitors right to the back of, um, of this motherboard. Which Windows 10 am I installing? I'm installing always the latest. I never, ever install anything but the latest. So we're on 1909 with Windows 10. Have I added, have I ever added rum to my Coke? Why would I ruin a perfectly good Coke by putting rum in it? No. 
not a big fan of alcohol. I'll, I'll drink socially if I'm somewhere a couple times a year, but I'm not a big, not much into drinking. It doesn't taste good, usually. I've had some drinks that taste good, but usually they don't. Randy says, I want to convert my DVDs and Blu-rays to digital, but I need a new optical drive. Can you recommend one? I think they're all pretty much the same now. So um, whatever you end up with will be, I'm sure, just fine. Okay, so that finishes the Windows 10 install. I guess I can plug uh, an Ethernet connection in it and we can grab the updates from Microsoft right now. So let me do that. Done with the flash drive so that can come out. We'll put that aside for another day, another Windows 10 install. And then that'll plug in there and we'll go back here to the router and we'll get it plugged in. And then that way we can visit Windows Update and start grabbing the updates to 1909, for which there are a few. See, now that I've plugged it into the network, it wants me to, again, create a Microsoft account. And in the bottom left corner, we'll just tell it to skip that. And now I can hit Windows Update. There we go. Cronus says, I don't drink because I fall asleep after two shots. Useless stuff. Well, not useless if you're trying to sleep. <laughs> All right, Zero Core, I'm going to give you your mod status back, but I, I want to remind my moderators that no moderator has ever been re had their moderator status removed from doing nothing. All right, so I need you guys... If somebody says, hey, I'm live, and they're trying to pull people from the channel, go ahead and hide them immediately. If somebody is cursing or being intentionally vulgar for the sake of being vulgar, you can remove them immediately. If you're in doubt, do nothing. If it doesn't fall under those two things, do nothing. If you want to bring it to my attention, um, again, no moderator has ever lost their status from saying, hey, Carrie, you might want to take a look at what this person's posting, and you may have to put it in the chat several times because the chat gets busy and I may not see it. And for that, I appreciate your help. But when you start becoming judge, jury, and executioner and you start banning people left and right, um, it's a real quick way to lose your mod status. And I, I don't want to hear whatever the justification was. Um, I just want to remind the mods who are a bit more assertive that if you choose to do nothing, you'll... I, it will never upset me, but if you uh, start banning people or arguing and bickering with people, I, I, it's not worth arguing, whatever it is. Uh, just ignore the person. 
you know, they're allowed to have uh, different opinions and whatnot. That's not a reason enough to ban them. Don't, don't use your personal feelings as justification for timing somebody out. Uh, please, please don't do that. And I appreciate all of your help. I do. I just don't want you to be a burden. I want you to be a help. Carrie, can I clone my new M.2 from my existing hard drive on an X79 motherboard? Can I clone my M.2 from my new existing hard drive? Well, an X79 isn't going to support booting from an M.2, as far as I know. You shouldn't even have an M.2 slot on an X79. I don't quite understand your question. Technically, Acronis will clone anything to anything. So Acronis will clone a hard drive to a hard drive or a solid state drive to a hard drive or a hard drive to a solid state drive or an M.2 to an NVMe or NVMe to hard drive or hard drive to NVMe. Any combination that you want to imagine, if it's a storage drive, Acronis will clone it. The answer is automatically yes. Now, will your, if you're putting that M.2 drive, if, if what you're trying to do is take all the data off of an older computer and make it bootable off an M.2 on a newer computer, that may not work. Although Acronis does have a utility called Universal Restore, which may help you in that endeavor, it would be really unwise to take a brand new super fast drive and then load it up with some old operating system, even if it's Windows 10 and carrying it over from another system because you're going to have a bunch of unnecessary drivers and registry entries that aren't going to apply to your new hardware and it probably is not going to work optimally even if you can get it to work it'll work better as a clean install but you know you may not care about that so just bear that in mind and decide accordingly but yes Acronis can do it so what you can do and what you should do <laughs> well those may be two different things So all I'm going to have to do now with the system, once we get Windows finished, is get the graphics card installed, hook up the optical drive, hook up the front case, man, and do the cable management on it. Oh, and we'll load the Samsung Magician and the Samsung NVMe driver on there as well. And um, yeah, that'll be good to go. Pretty fast install on this one. Pretty, pretty straightforward build. And I appreciate uh, Frank's patience in waiting for some more complicated builds ahead of his to get done, even though his build was relatively simple. Um, I'm just taking these, I'm building these in the order that they, that they came in for requests to build. So um, otherwise, I don't think it'd be fair to do it any other way.
John Cat says, Carrie, good work on your stream. Hey, thank you, John. What does it take to be turned blue? Basically, if you show up in the chat on a regular basis and you've shown to be um, supportive and kind to other people, uh, I turn you blue. For the most part, it's really nothing somebody asks for. It's something that is sort of gifted to you once I've reached that point that, that, that I can see that you are uh, a representative of an example of the, what this community is supposed to be, what I want this community to be. So all these people you see in blue have exhibited a very kind behavior to strangers. They don't engage in arguing with people and they're not abusive with their power. There's no real reason anybody should, so one of the warning signs is when somebody really wants to be blue, that concerns me a lot, but they're not doing it for the right reason. It's sort of like, what's it gonna take for you to like me? So why don't you like me now? That's not a likable quality. So I, I, people just need to be patient and, and be a regular example, of, be a regular in the chat room so I start to recognize you, and be an example of the behavior that we want to see, which again is kindness and support. Don't engage in arguments with people. And um, if you exhibit that behavior on a regular basis, I will turn you blue. It's just a matter of time. But I have to say, asking for it in many cases is a warning sign for me. Uh, that's. There's, there's no benefit for you to be blue. The benefit is for me. I don't require you or ask you to do anything as somebody in blue. I just want to be able to recognize you and understand that if, if somebody in blue says something that can be taken in a, as an insult or as a joke, I'll automatically assume it was meant as a joke if the person's blue who said it. If the person's not blue who said it, that means I don't really know them that well. And I don't know if they're poking me with a stick to get a reaction. It doesn't often convey well in messaging. So when you're joking, it always helps to put a little smiley face or something at the end of what you've written. Otherwise, people may assume you meant it seriously. So conveying information properly is very important when you're blue because you're representing me. And I want to make sure that, um, that I'm not misinterpreting what somebody means and if you're if you're in blue that that's really just again it's helpful to me that's all it doesn't really do anything for you at all other than give you the power to ban people and clearly that's becoming an issue here so uh, my goal is to turn everybody blue I would love everybody who comes here to be blue but unfortunately um, it's not possible to do that because we have people that you know, come once, they, they never show up again, or we have other people that have a bad day or they get drunk and they blame their behavior uh, based on the fact that they were drinking. You know what? If you're drinking, go drink alone, go to a bar, go somewhere, be around other drunks. Don't force me and other people to have to deal with you. Don't force sober people to have to deal with you intoxicated. That's completely in, uh, inconsiderate and isn't gonna fly here. And I've already, remove two people that were mods who said, well, I was drinking when I said that. Well, that's not the behavior I want from my mods. So, not cool. You go enjoy your drink, but uh, don't force sober people to have to deal with you. Joseph Panariello has contributed $10. Hey, thank you, Joseph.
Russ Mulligan's contributed $2. He says, thanks for all of your work here. Hey, thank you, Russ. And thank you for supporting the channel. And Dave Murray says, I like you, Carrie. <laughs> thanks, Dave. I like you, too. <laughs> Hopefully, we all like each other. Uh, Karma says, can you help me? I updated my Windows, and after that, it started crashing, and then I updated my BIOS. It just sounds like you either have an incorrect BIOS setting, so you should re restore your BIOS to default setting. You don't have to restore the version, but just make sure you load the default settings. And then run the mem test. You probably have some bad RAM. Most crashes are caused by bad RAM. Many of you watching probably have bad RAM right now, but you're not hitting it yet. So as long as you're staying below where the bad RAM is located with your memory allocations, you'll never know you've got bad RAM. So whenever you're running into these weird crashes and you can't get Windows to install fresh and clean without crashing, it's usually bad RAM that causes that. So you can run memtest86 or you can just go old school, take out all but one of your RAM modules and then do another clean install of Windows 10, see if it works. If it works, well, obviously one of the other sticks of RAM is bad. If it continues to fail, take out that one stick, replace it with a different stick that you previously removed and start again, reinstall Windows again. If it crashes again, uh, it doesn't sound like bad RAM. Now it sounds like you may have a bad CPU uh, or you've got, you know, it could be a bad power supply, it could be a bad motherboard, it could be a, a bad hard drive cable, or pretty much any single component on the system is now suspect and you will remove each part one by one and retest, reinstall and retest until the problem goes away and then that will be the answer to your problem. But in most cases, it'll start and stop with RAM. Gary Tatum's contributed $5. He says, I'm off to work. Great show, Gary. Hey, thanks, Gary. We can restart this now. What's the best motherboard on the market to get for gaming and doing regular stuff on a PC? Uh, any motherboard available on the market will do that. You just have to decide which one's right for you. Be like walking into a barber and going, which haircut's the best? Walk into a restaurant and see that menu and go, which one of these things on the menu is best? And ask that to four different people, get four different answers. They're all good. Depends who you ask. So you're going to have to try and do your research and uh, come up with, uh, with what works for you, your budget, your expectations, and your requirements that are unique to you. So Karma's responded, but Karma didn't listen. I, I forget Memtest 86. Just take the RAM out, just like I suggested. It's really frustrating to me when someone asks for help and then they ignore it. See if we got any more Windows updates. A 
Okay, with that being done, I guess I can put the Samsung software on there. So I've got that on my utilities flash drive right over here. Should be able to get that loaded up pretty quick. Joseph Jarst Jarstifer has contributed five dollars. Says Kerry, I find uses for information frequently. Okay, let's take a look here. We're going to need Prime 95 on this and HW Monitor. And we will eventually do Heaven Benchmark. And we're going to want Crystal Dismark. And hopefully, this is all the latest versions. It's the NVMe driver for Samsung. And then that'll need to reboot. Should be a relatively quick reboot here. And then we'll go to back to the flash drive again. And then what I want to do is verify that we have the latest firmware installed and then uh, make sure that the NVMe driver from Samsung is recognized. And then we can run Crystal Dismark and we should see about between 35 and 3600 megabytes per second sequential read speeds on this bad boy. And that'll let me know that everything's running as it should. There we go. Now, if there is an update right down here where it says update, there'll be like a capital N for new. So that tells me everything is current. We look under the drive details and we can see the NVMe driver is from Samsung, not from Microsoft. That's good. It also verifies the latest firmware version here and that we're on PCI Gen 3 or PCIe rather, Gen 3 by 4. So with all that looking exactly like it should, we can now run Crystal Disk Mark, the portable version here. We'll run the 64-bit version, and we'll see what kind of numbers we can get. I guess I can unplug the flash drive now. I'm done with that. There we go. And I'm going to go ahead and move this camera back where it normally goes. That looks about right.
<laughs> Colin Robertson is like, holy crap, that reboot was quicker than my start menu opening. <laughs> That's funny. Carrie, would it be worth it to upgrade from a Core i5-3470 to a Core i7-4790? I can't tell you what something's worth to you. I can tell you what it's worth to me. I have no idea what something's worth to you. I mean, I might throw something in my trash that you say, oh, that's perfectly good, and you take it. So, or, or vice versa, maybe you throw something in the trash, and I'm like, hey, that's perfectly good. I can't tell you what's worth anything to you, and nor can anybody else. Uh, you can describe to somebody how you use the computer, uh, the kind of things you, you operate the computer, uh, the tasks that you try to accomplish, and whether or not those tasks would be faster with that chip. But even then, it'd be hard to determine if the cost difference is worth the performance difference for those tasks that you do. That's something you have to figure out on your own. I, nobody in the world can tell you that. Not with any accuracy. I mean, they can tell you anything they want to, but it's just noise, static. Should you look for Thunderbolt 3 on the motherboard? If you require Thunderbolt 3, you should, and if you don't, then you shouldn't. You see, the whole reason why all of these parts exist is to meet the unique needs, budget, and expectations, and wants and desires of each individual owner. And what's right for one owner may not be at all right for another owner. That's the beauty of the individualism that PCs bring. If you can't comprehend, if it's not within you to understand the differences of people's wants, needs, and desires, then you can buy a pre-built machine or you can buy an Apple machine, which are all pre-built, and you can just do that. Because if you don't see the value in selecting and having a choice of numerous different configurations that meet your individual needs and budget and wants and desires, then there's no benefit to you. Like, you might as well just go buy a pre-built, go buy a Mac and, and, you know, do that. Looks like our final numbers, oops, where's my screen? Final numbers are posted right there. That's the Samsung 970 Evo Plus. Super fast drive, very, very fast. And I'm very happy with those numbers. I'm going to run Uncle Carrie's Windows 10 optimization tool, although I won't be able to see some of it until, like, I can't add the My Computer icon to the desktop because Windows is not yet activated. But we can still run the tool anyway. You'll see I always copy it off to the desktop. I never run it from the flash drive. And if you guys are running an older version or you're not sure, there's uh, free updates. Just go to Options and check for updates and make sure you've got the latest version. We'll just hit Apply, and it'll do what it needs to do here. And then we'll reboot. All those settings that I like to change, it takes me like 10 minutes. It's already done. And I just hit to restart, and we're good to go. Daniel wants to know, he says, Carrie, I looked at the specs of the Ryzen 3950X, and it points out that it would be useful in the 570 or the X570 motherboards for the PCIe version uh, generation 4. And uh, would this mean that it's preferable to use that CPU before using M2 NVMe SSDs? Uh, again, that's only something you can decide. There's a, a, a it seems like there's this weird behavior on the internet that 
if something is two milliseconds faster and two, costs two hundred and fifty dollars more, that you should buy that that you should spend that $250 to get those two milliseconds. I don't agree with that. I'm a practical person. I'm going to ask you, what do you need? Forget what anybody says on the internet. What do you need? How much money do you have to spend? And based on that, we can recommend parts. And that takes an hour and a half on the phone. I can't just blindly see people on the random strangers on the internet and tell you what you need. I can't tell you if PCIe 4 is a complete waste of money for you. I can tell you for 95% of the people who buy it, it's a complete waste of money. You will see better benchmarks and you will see slightly better performance, but the cost differential is so extreme for the amount of performance you're getting back, it's hardly worth it. I've, I've built a 3950X here with the X570 motherboard. And I did it because I knew a lot of people want to watch it. The people are just hung up on this idea that if it's milliseconds faster, it's worth throwing money at. And I just cannot get on board with that logic. I know people that are running machines that are eight years old that are more than fast enough to do everything they need them to do today. And I've got other people that I run into online who spend all kinds of money all the time on their hardware. They're always trying to have the latest and greatest. I just don't have that kind of money, so I can't get on board with that mentality. Furthermore, I don't have that kind of time to keep reconfiguring everything over and over and over again. So what I do is I have a consultation with any client, and I get to know them. I get to ask them a bunch of questions. It takes about 90 minutes before I can even suggest a motherboard, right? So to watch a YouTube channel or to read a Reddit forum or something and they're saying this is, you know, the system that's great for, you know, for general purpose gaming, that's just garbage. It's just garbage information. Now, if you go to a specific forum to say a game, you want to know what's the best graphics card for Red Dead Redemption 2 on two 4K monitors multi-screen. That information will be beneficial. If you want to know, uh, I, I play GTA 5, and I want to play it with all the bells, whistles, and features. Is it going to be beneficial for me to get an RTX graphics card? In those forums, answering that specific question, they can help you. But to just come in and go, what's good, general? It's such a vague question. The idea that you can get any specific answer and think it's useful is preposterous. The vaguer... The more vague, is vaguer a word? The more vague you are with your question, the less useful the answer is going to be that people offer you. So uh, at some point, it's really up to you to do your own research and to figure out, is that price differential and performance differential worth it? And furthermore, would it benefit me at all? And based on that, you should decide accordingly what's right for you. And that doesn't mean it applies to anybody else on the planet but you. And again, that's the beauty of the PC, is that you can individualize it. We're all individuals. We're all unique. And we all have different budgets, different wants, and different needs and desires. And to ask a complete stranger what's right for you, I'm sure they'll tell you. And I, I'm also sure that information will be completely useless to you. But they do make pre-builts. You know, you can go, you can buy an Alienware or something like that if that's your thing. But I think it's a real shame because I think for just a little bit of time and research on your own, you can save a lot of money and build a machine that'll be the best machine, the most reliable, the quietest, the fastest that you'll ever build, and it'll never be cheaper for that specific configuration. And if you're not willing to pay somebody to do that research for you, like I would charge $125 because it's hours of research on top of a couple hours on the phone, or at least an hour and a half on the phone talking to you. 
So why would I do that for free? There is a person that does it for free. Her name is Catherine Anna Hauserman, and she's, uh, I don't know if I see her in there today, but she's often hanging out in blue in the chat, and she will build parts lists for people, and she will ask you those questions. And she's a rare bird in the sense that there's not many people that would do that much work to individualize and research component selection for compatibility and budget for free. And she does it in return for a thank you. So you can reach out to her on Facebook, but ultimately, if I were you, I'd do the research myself. It's just far more fulfilling when you pick your own parts and you put it together yourself and it's exactly everything you wanted. Mike Yazzie's contributed $5. Hey, thank you, Mike. Emma Gerbas says, good job, Gary. This is a great stream. Hey, thank you. Thank you for the kind words. me do this. Um, we'll shut this computer down. Let me throw the graphics card in there. I think we're ready for that. Whoops, I think I hit restart. Let me do that again. Well, we'll test our boot time anyway. Is your Windows search bar working? So there is a, a Windows update that caused the Windows search bar to stop working. And it's a real easy fix. There's a little registry tweak. If you go to bleeping computer.com uh, there's an article that there's a little bridge file you can download to disable the Bing search and then you can turn it back on after Microsoft fixes this issue I surprised how many people use Windows search I never use it myself but uh, bleeping computer.com talks about um, in the news section the Windows search function it stopped working after a recent update Let me find the link for you. Yeah, here it is. And there's a little reg file you can download. It's completely safe. And you can right click on it. Well, it, it tells you, it explains everything in this article, which I'm putting right now into the chat room. And that'll fix your search. It's super easy. It's not a big deal. <clears throat> picking the wrong mouse. So the Mugen 5 price keeps moving back and forth. Someone says it's back to $62 and I just confirmed it. That is That is what it says. Mugen 5 revision B is 62.14. It was 48.99 earlier today. So basically, as long as you know that the regular price is, uh, I think, 47.99, just hold off purchasing. Put it on your Amazon wish list and watch the price. Check it daily. Uh, check it numerous times a day. Check it in the morning. Check it in the evening. It will fluctuate that quickly sometimes. That's weird. I don't know why it's doing that, but uh, Amazon does that all the time. And I talked about that on a previous stream where I advise people to put a couple of items in their Amazon wish list, like the, uh, the 4K 60 frames per second uh, Elgato PCIe capture card. It goes from $199.95 to $293 overnight. And then if you wait, it'll go back down to $199 again. That's a huge price difference. So be aware, uh, before you buy anything at Amazon, I would put it to a wish list and then just click your wish list daily and watch the prices and you'll get a good idea. Some, some products don't move at all. Like these microphones I buy, they're locked in at $599. 
or 598. They don't budge ever. So at that point, I can watch for used ones that become available, something like that. Okay, so now I've got this shut off, and let's pull the flash drive out. We're done with that. And I also want to cut power before plugging or unplugging any devices in to the motherboard because the motherboard always has power running through it even when the system is off. So you either have to cut power at the power supply or pull the plug or both. And then there's still power that takes about a minute or so to drain out of the capacitors. But that'll already happen by the time I get the card out of the box. And sometimes these screws that, on a brand new case, they're loose for some reason. So I've learned to go through these and, and tighten each one up because I don't need those vibrating free and bouncing around inside the computer while it's being shipped. So the graphics card here is the G4 1660 Ti. I think this is a great value for a graphics card. It's you know right around $300. Um, you know, obviously, if you're a big-time gamer, you're going to want the best video card on the market. If you're doing big video edits and things, you obviously want the best video card on the market. But if you're sort of on the fence where you do a little bit, you dabble a little bit, or you want to just do everything in 1080 anyway, um, I think the value for the dollar on the 1660 Ti is, uh, is a really good deal. Well, it's like a box in a box. That's all there is. It's like a Russian nesting doll. How many different things do I have to, to, to open up? This is a big anti-static bag. Card's even got a nice back plate on it. It's a nice touch. We'll take that off of there, and we'll take that off of there. And then we've got some plastic, which of course in red lettering says, remove protective film before use. So let's do that. Looks good to me. We've got three video outputs on this card. There's DVI, HDMI, and DisplayPort. And it's only going to require one power connector, one 8-pin power connector. And so to install this, always goes in the topmost slot. And that'll be your fastest slot. And then we'll put that right in there. And then we'll secure it with the same two screws we just removed. There's one. And there's the other one. And then I'll grab one of these power cables and we'll slap that on there real quick. And then we'll unplug the HDMI from the built-in graphics and plug it into our discrete graphics card right here. Now I can turn it back on, and then we can load the NVIDIA driver. Holy smokes, that booted quick. Now it's going to automatically load an NVIDIA driver. If I'm just patient, you will see the screen blank out and come back again and the size of the icons like right now they go from top to the from the top of the screen to the bottom and you'll know when the new video driver goes in because the icons will get smaller and they won't go across the entire length of the screen because the resolution
will have increased. And again, this will happen automatically if I just leave it alone. Windows Update is going to grab that driver and apply it whether I like it or not. In the meantime, I can go to NVIDIA and download the latest driver, but this is still going to happen in the background. I'll show you. So if I go right now to bring up the internet, and let's close that, and we'll go to NVIDIA.com. And then we'll go to drivers, GeForce drivers. And I like to do the manual driver search, which is the GTX 16 series. Oh, see the screen blank out? That's putting the new driver on. Do you see everything just got smaller? That just happened automatically. That's what I really like about Windows 10 is it just takes care of things for you. Now that's not gonna be the best driver, but it gets you up and running. And let's see. Um, we have a 1660 Ti. I think these all point to the same file. I'm not sure why they make you pick Yeah, we'll just run it. Poco says, another excellent video. Frank should be very pleased. I hope so. I hope so. What's up, Lyle boy? It's not time yet, boys. It's not time. You're like way early. Give me that look. Don't you give me that look. Wag that tail. Stinker. That's good. So we got our driver installed. And then I'll wait for the, um, oh, you're gonna, now he's getting the box. Get that power supply box, boy. You get it, get it. Tell it who the boss is.
Did I say you could have that? Where are you going with that? Hey, get back over here. Bring that over here. I didn't say you could have that. Stinker. You're just looking for trouble. Is that what it is? You're like, oh, if you're not going to feed me, I'm just going to tear up your kitchen. Is that how it's going to work? Now what are you going to do with it? Get it. Get it. Boy, there's a box. There's a box. Are you done? Did you make enough noise? Okay, thanks for the entertainment, Lyle. Oh, wait, he's going back? No. <laughs> All right. Oh, that was fun. Let's see here. Let's get the Heaven benchmark running now that we've rebooted. And the Drabco has contributed to thirty six ninety nine Croatian Kunas which is about $5.46 US. Thank you so much for helping support the channel and keeping me sponsor free. I appreciate that very much. All right, let me do F9 to start this benchmark. That was pretty quick. All right, F9. There we go. Why is that shutting down? What am I missing here? Is it running twice? Oh, <laughs> didn't know it would run twice. Hold on. That's not good. Can I quit this? How can I quit you? I don't know how I did that. Let's close it down. Start over. Just close it all. Shut her down. All right, we're going to try this again. Thing's so fast, it started it twice. Man, I've never seen it. <laughs> I've never seen it do that before. Okay, and now when that started. Oh, well, wait a minute. Why did it do that? What is it doing? I have a sticky mouse or something? When I hit run, and it loads. And then it minimizes it. That's really strange.
wonder why it does that. I think I'm going to quit and restart the computer. I've never seen that be behavior before. We'll shut it down. Bob says that new computer is faster than old carry. Yeah, well, it's a lot faster. A lot faster. Yeah. Man, that boots fast. Okay. Uh, let's do that again. Let's go to... Waiting for that Samsung to load. There it is. Is that it? No, that's the security center. What does that want? Set up OneDrive. No. Sign in. No. Okay. Michael Spangard has contributed 25 Danish krona. Thank you, Michael. Let's see, F9 to start the benchmark. There we go. And then let me just bring this up a little bit so you can see the frame rate, because I know my logo covers that up. We'll just bring it down like that. And now you should be able to see those numbers in that bottom right corner as it's uh, going through the benchmark. Oh, no. See, something's broken. Something is definitely not working right here. We have a problem that needs to be fixed. And this is why I run the benchmarks. I'm not running it to look for setting any records with frames per second. I'm running it to ensure that things run properly, that they're running about the speed they're supposed to. And this weird behavior that we're seeing right now uh, is cause for concern. So I think what I want to do is... Um, Shut it back down again. And let me go full screen on my side so I can see a little better. Let's make sure all the BIOS defaults are loaded. Normally, like I said, I haven't done anything in the BIOS and I shouldn't have to. But I'll hit the delete key here on the keyboard until we get into the BIOS. And we're going to go right over to save and exit. And there should be an option there that says to load optimized defaults that's exactly what i want and that should be all we need to do it may not have changed anything and we'll save and exit that now this can happen if I have a stuck key on the keyboard or the mouse could create a very similar symptom and as I was moving around in the BIOS, it felt like the keyboard wasn't responding properly. Every time I went to save and exit, it took me one more over. And they, I may have a situation here where I've got a, a stuck key that's causing this problem. So what I'm going to do, just for experiments, is I'm going to pull this keyboard and mouse, and I'm going to borrow the one off of the streaming machine. So we'll just grab it from the streamer, and we'll plug it in here. Now, see if it behaves the same way. And yeah, it's so so it's not a keyboard or mouse that's causing this. Something is is bringing it back to the desktop. That's very interesting. And I'm not exactly sure why. So this, again, one of the first places I would start would be with the RAM. So what I'm going to do is um, 
Let's see if we can stop this benchmark, first of all. Yeah, it keeps doing that. It keeps taking me back. That's very strange. Very strange. Let's shut it back down. And let's run Memtest 86 on it. I've got a Memtest 86 flash drive here that I've created, which I show how to do on my uh, Quick Tips video. Put that keyboard and mouse back into the streamer. We'll plug this keyboard and mouse back in. And let's boot to Memtest 86. I missed the opportunity to boot. I mean, to uh, go into the boot menu. Mm -hmm. That's what I meant to say. Let's do that again. So if I hit F12 on this keyboard, it should take me into a boot menu, and I should be able to select the USB drive. Irving says, I have the same problem as you with Heaven. I've never seen the Heaven benchmark do this before, so take a look. You had errors when you set up the Heaven program? Did I? I didn't see them. Let me just double check. We'll check the RAM here real quick. Even new RAM can have a problem. This test is going to start in seven seconds. You'll see the countdown way up at the top of the screen. It's on test number three. We'll, we can take it up to like test seven. And if it's clear through test seven, it's probably okay. So far, everything looks good. It's only been a minute. I just tried it too. William Dawson says, I'm getting the same results running the new video driver. Could be video driver related. It's, I was thinking the same thing. It's entirely possible. We could go to the previous uh, driver. So if that's the case, let me turn this back off. And let's boot back into Windows and download the previous driver from NVIDIA. Just for giggles. Oops. 
So we want to go to NVIDIA.com. We want drivers, GeForce drivers. GTX 16 series, 1660 Ti. So that's the game ready driver, 44219. Here's the previous game ready driver, 44187. Let's grab that one. That's just from a couple weeks ago. Four weeks ago. Kind of curious if I should uninstall this other driver first. Let's see what it does when we try to install it without uninstalling the newer driver. John Daniel says, I've noticed the issue with heaven popping back to Windows desktops the last couple of weeks on many different PCs I'm building. Well, that's reassuring.
Um, they're mentioning I may have not installed the uh, x86 version. You need both the 64-bit and the 16-bit, or 32-bit rather, version of the uh, Visual C runtime or Heaven Benchmark doesn't run properly. And when I install it on the smaller screen, yeah, see it's installed. It's already there. There's a repair option and a remove. And then on the 64-bit one, there's a repair. So I did get them both. So those are both fine. So it's not, that's not what it is. Um, it doesn't hurt to check it though. Let's try this again with a different video driver and see if it runs any differently. Yeah, it's already went back to the desktop. Huh. It's interesting. Hmm, doesn't really give us anything there. Could try uninstalling and reinstalling it, though. I can't imagine that's really going to make any difference. Also shouldn't hurt. Okay, let me load it off the flash drive. And we're going to do this one more time. I can't imagine that this is going to make any difference at all. But I'm going to do it anyway. Because when things aren't working correctly, you can't assume things you have not actually tested. That's interesting. And then we'll see what happens this time around. Yeah, did it again. Huh. It lets me run it multiple times. That's how I had it running twice before. It lets it run again. That's very strange. And then it just, now it's got it down here in two windows. So my, my concern is whether or not a Windows update causes this or if there's something wrong. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the other benchmark I've got. Whoops, this isn't what I wanted. So let's, for now, let's quit this. 
And I can work on that a little later, do a little more research when I'm not live to figure out what's going on. But it's definitely outside of the norm. And then let's go to the flash drive again. And I'll grab uh, superposition. We'll try that out. And that's just loading right off the flash drive, so it's a little bit slower than if I copied it to the desktop, but that's okay. Just takes a moment, and then we'll see if this benchmark runs correctly. We'll just keep an eye on this one. If this one works and the other one has an issue, then it's probably nothing wrong with the hardware. But because it is a new build, of course, I want to be extremely cautious. I don't want to ship this hundreds or thousands of miles away and then have the client need to send it back to me for something that um, needs to be fixed. Freedom Flights has contributed $4.99. He says, I wonder if you use the older version of the benchmark. I'm not aware of an older version. Heaven 4.0, as far as I know, is, is it. I think I'm probably covering up all the benchmark numbers with my video, aren't I? Let me turn my camera off. Ah, there's the numbers.
And there's our final numbers of our benchmark results. So that's good. The machine flew through a far more intensive benchmark without any issues. So that makes me feel better that there's nothing wrong with the machine. Uh, there's got to be perhaps a Windows 10 update that's causing this issue with the uh, regular Heaven benchmark. And I can hook up another machine um, later on tonight and run it on a different machine to see if it performs exactly the same way, if it uh, is related to the NVIDIA driver or if it's a Windows update that's causing it. But it's the same software. I know my Windows 10 install is good. I know the BIOS is good. I, I know all this other stuff um, uh, that people have recommended in the chat room doesn't apply in this case because I'm building multiple computers using all the same software. So when something different happens, and the question is, is it a piece of hardware not working? What's different between this machine and others? And one would be the version of the driver from NVIDIA, and then the current updates from Windows would be different. Those would be the only two things that have changed. So that's ideally, or more likely, where the solution to the problem is going to be found. So I think that's going to wrap it up for me for today because I haven't eaten yet today and I'm starting to feel it. So I think I'm going to wrap this one up and then I will um, finish up the cable management on this build later tonight. Let me go full screen back on camera one. And I still have this contact lens. It's kind of bothering me. So I think I might want to play around with that a little bit too. So for everybody who's contributed during today's stream, let me give you all um, shouts out there. Freedom Flights and Hugh Wong is and Michael Spangard, Zdravko Franchevic, Mike Yazzie, Paul Thompson. Paul said, I love your channel, Carrie. Been watching your videos since 2010 and listening to Tech Vets for years. You guys helped me get my business off the ground. Right on. And uh, Andrew Lipinski, Joseph Jars. Dorfer, Jorstifer, Gary Tatum, Joseph Panariello, Ross Mulligan, Rick Hubbard, 191 by 7, Tony Wallow, Peter Laycock, Samuel Ramos, SNXG God, Madi Yoel, Jesse Kirk, uh, a couple more there from Madi, thank you Madi, Michael Dane, Mike C, Andrew Lipinski again, Hugh Wong, and Madi again, Bear Paul, David Santiago, Cogjin, Scott Weaver, Oyvind Wethel, John Craig, Rick Hubbard, Dimitri, Michael Martin, Glenn Davies, Bearpaw, Oyvind Wethel again, and Peter Laycock again, Thomas Robinson, Chris's Tech and Variety Channel, David Griswold, Brendan Looney, and Hugh Wong. So thanks you guys so much for helping to keep me sponsor free. And thanks to all my friends in blue, keeping it civil in the chat room from the um, folks coming in here trying to cause trouble. And to everybody else, not yet blue, I do hope I'll be turning you all blue very soon. Uh, just be kind and supportive in the chat room. That's all I ask. Thanks, you guys, for joining me on the build. And my appreciation, of course, to Frank for being patient on this build. And I'm just going to do a little bit more research on it. It makes me a little uneasy. I want to replicate the problem or attempt to replicate the problem on an identical build just to see if it happens, if it happens on another build. And, and I am seeing people in the chat saying they've experienced it too. So there's probably a Windows update that's causing it, I'm guessing. But um, I, I need to know. <laughs> I have to know. <laughs> all right, guys. Hey, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you all again uh, very, very soon. Until then, bye for now.